We, we don't want to break the peace, right, by, by clapping. Ah, oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, uh, I'm the Reverend Edward Trout. You can tell that because I'm going to put a stole on. And uh, I want to start this morning with a story. This may be a familiar story to some of you. I've heard many, many versions of the story, and apparently it comes from cultures all around the world, which I found fascinating. This particular version comes from the site Story Planet. Once upon a time, there lived a mischievous monkey outside a fruit farm in a village. The whole day, he would jump from tree to tree, plucking the ripe fruits and eating them. The orchard keeper tried all the ways to trap the monkey, but he could not. One day, the monkey went out of the farm and into the village. There, he was excited to see the markets and the houses and the people, and he, he entered into some of the houses and found his favorite eatables there. He sneaked some in his hands and ran away. And by that evening, he had made the life difficult for the people of that village. This village is more fun than that farm, he thought. I will live here. So days went by, and the monkey's mischief grew every day. The people of that village were terrorized by the monkey, but they didn't know how to get rid of it. But one day a juggler came to the village. The village people approached the juggler and said, we want to get rid of that monkey. You should help us do that. The juggler replied, friends, don't worry, I will help you. Please give me some pots with a very narrow necks. And soon the village people gave him the jars that he asked for, large jars with narrow necks. The juggler took those jars and put some peanuts into them. Then he placed those jars near the place where the monkey stayed. The monkey saw the jars and was curious to know what was inside them, so he put his hand inside the first jar and he could feel the peanuts inside. He immediately put his hand in the other jar and grabbed a handful of peanuts. So since he was holding onto the peanuts in his hands and the necks of the jars were very narrow, he could not take his hands out. He was so greedy, he would not allow himself to drop the peanuts. So soon, the juggler and a few other men ran to that place, and the poor monkey, with the large jugs stuck to his hands, could not run away, and he was caught by the villagers. So just out of curiosity, who has heard variations of that monkey trap jar story? Okay, good. Um, as I said, it is a, it's a frequently told story in various ways. Uh, sometimes it's jars, sometimes it's coconuts, sometimes they're filled with things, sometimes they're tied to trees, whatever. But the same concept underlies it all. The monkey is his own undoing. He is so greedy that he will not let go of that thing, even though if he can't get it out of the jar, it doesn't serve him. So how often do we, and by we, I mean me, looking at myself, but how often do we get ourselves trapped by those things that we just want and we grasp so harshly that we will not let go of them, even though at that moment it's not serving us? and it's trapping us in something and somewhere where we don't want to be. Uh, today I'm going to talk really about three different elements. I realized as I was working on this talk, this could be a whole series, this could be workshops, I'm not going to do that to you today. <laughs> but uh, this is about the concept of what do we keep and what do we give away and how do we do that. Uh, and I want to look at the physical level, which the monkey here is really functioning on that physical level, uh, I want to look at our emotional level and kind of that mental, psychological level, and then I want to look at the spiritual level. So we'll hit all three of those levels with this concept. So let's start with the physical, the easiest to view, right? The things around us, the things we keep in our home. Um, there was a, a great slide our own Darlene Parnell had shared with us about clutter this week. I believe it came from uh, a Law of Attraction group uh, Sue, if you can move to that slide, but I'll read it anyway. It says, remove clutter as soon as possible. There's a reason you feel so good after cleaning your home. Your home is an extension of your aura. Get rid of old belongings that aren't aligned with who you are anymore. Old things carry old energy. Broken things carry stuck energy. Release them all. If any of you were raised like me, 
that can be hard. <laughs> uh, in my family growing up, you know, if it could still serve a purpose, if we might need it someday, you would hold on to it just because, you know, the minute you get rid of it, you're going to find you needed it. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to a few of you? I'm seeing some heads, of, yes, and some, some laughter. Um, but if it's not serving you, we tend to hold on to those things, and then we storm away, we stick them away. Um, speak, speaking of our own home, we have an older home that has all kinds of little cubbies and places where you, you could stick all kinds of things in there and forget what you have and where you have it. And that happens. It, it happens to us all the time. And in fact, uh, as many of you have kind of followed our journey, because Michael can't help but posting, uh, we... <laughs> There is a carriage house that is going up to, re to replace a carriage house that used to be on the property years ago. It's only, it's only been a plan 20 years in the making. Uh, so as that carriage house is going up and there's other work being done, we realize we, we really need to go through like room by room, area by area, closet by closet, and just see what's there, see what we no longer need, donate, get rid of whatever, get rid of the stuff. Uh, and it's a process. It's a long process. But there is some beauty in recognizing this thing doesn't serve us. If it is broken, if it's useless, or, or if you're like me, what's this little thing? It's a piece of something. I don't know what this is. I better hold on to that. It must be important, or God would not have put it in my path to find. So I'll stick it here, and I never find the purpose for that thing. And it still sits around years later. It's like, oh yeah, that little piece of something. So... I, we're in the process of getting rid of those pieces, getting rid of the things that's like, I don't even know what it is. What the heck is that thing? And if, if we know what it is, but it does not serve us, let it go. Give it to somebody that can use it. Donate it somewhere, Goodwill, Salvation Army, wherever your place of donation is, or call up friends or have a, have a giving away party. You're like, hey, come over. Here's a room full of stuff. Take what you want, right? Um, so... This is, this is great on the worldly level, and I think we understand the benefit of that um, because it does start kind of getting into our emotional side as well, right? When we release those things, we feel the release of that energy. We feel lighter. We feel unburdened when we let those things go. Um, as part of my seminary experience, we had to create our own personal code of ethics. And... Uh, it, it, that was also a long process. I, it went through several drafts and variations and talking with my dean. But I ended up with nine different principles that kind of encapsulates my approach to life and ethics. For me, my third one is I will not take anything which does not belong with me. So obviously there are commandments about, you know, you should not steal, you shall not. Um, and this does encompass that, because if it doesn't belong with me, I should not be taking it. However, the, the word with is very intentional there. Not belonging to me, but with me. Long ago, when I was looking at, you know, life, the universe, everything. Uh, thank you, Douglas Adams. Uh, 42 is the meaning. Uh, but looking at those things and looking at how we are all created of nothing but energy squiggles of energy just rearranged into different things that we recognize as certain patterns. And the thought occurred to me, the question came like, okay, how does, how does one bit of squiggled energy own another bit of energy? And I came to the conclusion that in the energetic sense, in the spiritual energetic sense, I can't really own anything, but I can be compatible with things. There are things that belong with me. Sometimes you meet a person, and immediately you're just like, I feel like I have known you forever, right? In that first meeting. Those are energies that are compatible and work together. So you take those things that belong with you. That also goes for other people's opinions of you. <laughs> Their opinion of you does not matter unless it matches your energy. If it does not belong with you, don't carry it. And so many of us carry those patterns. We carry things that we learned when we were very young children. So much of that subconscious pattern is set by the time we are seven. And we hold on to it. It's hard to let go. 
as much as we do release ceremonies, we do burning bowls, we let go and let God all the time. We do. And yet, sometimes that imprint of the pattern still remains, right? So in our most challenged times, in our most troubling times, in those dark nights of the soul, you'll still see that shadow of that pattern come back. So, energy and who you are. Like, this is all how you use your energy, how you determine who you are, what the world gets from you. That's all up to you, right? The world is pretty much guaranteed to give us all things we really don't want to deal with. Pretty much a guarantee there will be some struggles in there. And one of the things, going back to that scientific mind, one of the things about energy, and many of you know this, some of you may be able to complete it, energy is neither what? Energy is neither created nor destroyed. All the energy is there. Sometimes it's latent energy in the form of an object's mass. Sometimes it's active energy, but you only transmute it. Nothing changes energetically. The energy is always there, but you transmute it. And guess what? We are the means of transmutation of so much energy. Us. We are transmuters. So when people or events or just the world at large sends you all of that negative garbage, your job, when you receive that, is to transform it. This is not an easy task. Um, often you find with creative people, their darkest experiences turn into some of the most beautiful art and music and films and poetry, right? Um, and everybody has their own creative outlets. So it's up to you to realize, for some people it's sports and you, you need to get out there and be physically active. For some people it's simply organizing. Like, I, I received all of this, and I'm going to somehow make it make more sense by organizing. Great. That's a positive outlet for you. Um, we had a young performer. Some of you are aware, uh, the young artist production, production of Godspell, at Phil, I just opened. Michael and I have both worked on that. There was a, a young performer last night who had a little bit of an anxiety attack. And after the performance was doing their best to help set props for people for the next day. And people were telling him, like, don't, make them do their own. And this performer was like, no. And that was their means of taking something that was sitting on them, sitting on their heart, and transmuting it into something positive. It's like, oh, you get it. You don't need this lesson. You get it. You know what you're doing. Um, there's the dandelion image that Michael chose for this week. Once he showed me that image, I, I immediately loved that image. We've got a couple of dandelions, right? Both gone to seed. But one still has all the seeds held in. And one is just releasing them to the wind. So which of these dandelions are you, or are you somewhere in the middle? Right? Because the dandelion on your left, holding onto the seeds, has all this potential, but it's only going to create a dandelion patch right where it is. The things will drop and surely they will take some root, and then they will all fight for nutrients right in the same spot, because it's not actually spreading and doing. The other one, it can fill an entire meadow with dandelions by releasing out into the world. So do you drop your things right here and keep everything closed, or do you let it out into the world? Do you share it out there? Um, and again, these are easy concepts to talk about, and I know sometimes in practice they get much harder, right? And you leave here thinking, yes, I'm going to spread my dandelion seeds out into the world. I'm going to make a huge difference. And then that person shows up that always shows up, that just gets in your head, gets in your way. Um, I mentioned artists earlier. Who here is familiar with, it's an older book, but there's still current things with it, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron? Great. More hands than I thought I might see. So Julia Cameron, it's a great book for creatives, and if you don't think you're a creative, it's still a great book for you. I, I do recommend it. It's an older book, but some great concepts in it. One of the things that she talks about in that book is crazy makers. And I have to admit, when I read that book, however many decades ago at this point, I was reading it, and I went, there's a name for those people. 
Like, I could name the ones in my life. I just didn't have, like, yes! Uh, and I was recently rereading some of her, her information on crazy, crazy makers. And she said they all really share, like, certain qualities where you might be able to go, ah, I see what's going on here. So she says, one, they, they break deals and ignore schedules. They expect the world to cater to their whims. They discount your perceptions. They spend your time and your money. They triangulate with people they deal with. In other words, they're talking about you to other people. They are superior blamers. They create dramas, but seldom where they belong. They hate schedules, unless it's their own. They love chaos, and chiefly, they will deny that they are crazy makers. Um, I'm just curious, does anybody recognize anybody that they have known in their life from any of those things? Okay, okay, good. If you didn't raise a hand, hallelujah, good for you. Let me know, let me know how you manage that. Uh, she goes on to say, crazy makers can show up anywhere. She said, you might not even ever see them, yet they still drive you crazy over the internet or over the phone. They may be dead, but still alive and well in your mind. They might be second-guessing your every thought in your mind. Or you may, may realize, with a gasp, you are the crazy maker. <laughs> right? Uh, I think, on some level, we're each a crazy maker for somebody, somewhere. And that, that really pulls us, you know, into that, that spiritual, emotional thing where we're getting into uh, our sense of peace. So there's a very mental aspect to this, a very emotional side to it, and emotions can sometimes be hard to navigate because we can't always just decide our emotions. They show up. Uh, but I want to share, there's a poem that was shared with me this week. This will be the first of two poems today. Apparently, I'm on a poem kick lately. I don't know why. But Shirley Smith, our own Shirley, uh, who has not been here in person for a while now recently, but she is here every week online, commenting, loving. Uh, she will send Michael and myself things as well and messages. This was a poem she sent me this week, and I read it, and I loved it. And I immediately said, asked her two questions. One, is this your poem? And two, can I share it? And she said, yes and yes. So the poem is called Carousel of Life. Up and down, and round and round. Climb aboard for the ride of your life. As night changes to day and day to night, one step forward and two steps backwards, dancing as fast as you can has put you spinning out of control. Where your anchor continues to be your faith-drenched soul, the light, the dark, and the highs and the lows, the soaring spirit, replacing your woes. Questions and answers and problems, solution, all an intricate part of the universe and its evolution. Stress, struggle, and turmoil form a team when compassion, love, and peace should be the theme. Dark clouds Indigo skies and nightmares, replaced with sunshine, rainbows, and answered prayers. Then miracles of hope and come true dreams, while hearts take flight on heavenly wings, up and down and round and round. I loved that poem. And it so much talks to what I was just talking about earlier, that transmutation, right? We are the transmutors. We are the transmutators, however you want to put it. Um, we should get small potatoes, the trans transmutators. Uh, right? So the way she presents this, like we have these things, we have the stress and the struggle, when it should be love and peace, that's up to us up to us to recognize. And I know some of you are saying, but I cannot control all of that, right? I can't control every thought that comes to my head. I can't control every emotion that comes into my heart and into my mind. And you are absolutely correct. 
but that meditative process that many of us have, have become aware of, where you see the thing for what it is and then let it go, that comes into play here. So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, you, the spiritual you, the, the real you, the big capital Y you, is the one observing the things in your life. The thoughts you have are part of your worldly existence. It's your spiritual self seeing you having that thought. So when you're trying to meditate and a thought crosses your mind and won't leave you alone, you can visualize it as, say, a leaf in a stream going downstream. Or for some people, it's, I see flying carpets, and it's just like, there it goes, right? And you see it for what it is, and you let it go, whether it's a thought, an emotion, whatever. And you go, oh, I'm a human being this, experiencing this thing, but it's not me. I just realized I'm experiencing it. And if you can see it for what it is, you can more easily transmute it into what you want it to be. And one of the things, obviously one, one of our focuses for this month uh, in our year of possibilities is peace. We've talked about it today, we've sung about peace today, and peace is a choice. No matter my circumstances, I have the power to choose, and I choose peace. And yet so often, like our crazy makers, we let people steal our peace, right? That's the way we see it, peace stealers, right? Has anybody ever experienced a peace stealer? Okay. Um, here's the truth about peace stealers. You are their accomplice. They cannot steal your peace without you being willing to give it to them. I don't like that. It makes me responsible. I want it to be them. It's not. It's up to me to go, no, I see what you're doing. You know, the leaf in the river going back. I see it. I see what this is. The thought on the little magic carpet continuing its journey. I see it. I know it. Okay. Big me. The, the bigger consciousness sees this. I know what's going on. I can hold on to my peace, and I'm going to choose to hold on to my peace. It's a challenge, but that is what we are challenged to do. If we want a more peaceful world, as we sing every week, let it begin with me. The song doesn't say, and it's so easy, right? That's, the song never says that. It's work to hold our peace. Um, Carla Golden have shared something this week as well, our, our own Carla. I know many of you remember when Bob and Carla were here, uh, then they were down in Florida for a while, Texas now. She had shared a quote from Pima Children. Um, Pima Children, if you're not a, a familiar, is an American Tibetan Buddhist. Um, it written several books. And if we can bring up that quote as well, but it says, inner peace begins the moment you choose not to allow another person or event to control your emotions. That's the beginning of it. It begins at that. Inner peace begins when you choose not to allow another person or event to control your emotions. So as I said, it's, it is hard work. Right? It's really difficult work. And, and as I noted before, we have... We have done so many things to let go and let God, and we release all the time. And things still come up. Well, I was talking to a uh, mental health professional the last couple of weeks, and they had an observation about that. We were talking about the concept of let go, or let go and let God, and they, they said, you know, I've really grown to dislike that term. Just like, let it go. I was like, well, why? And they said, because sometimes people can't. And then they blame themselves because they can't let it go. So what they use and what they recommend is let it be. Let it be. Oh, I see it. I see what it is. I, I know what you're doing. I see what that emotion's doing. Okay. In this moment, I can't change it, but I can let it be. And realize it's not me. It's, it doesn't define me. I'm bigger than all that. Let it be. I'm just full of quotes and things today. Thich Nhat Hanh. 
<laughs> uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk, had said, if an arrow hits you, you will feel pain in that part of your body where the arrow hit. And then if a second arrow comes and strikes exactly at the same spot, the pain will not only double, it will become at least ten times more intense. The unwelcome things that happen in life, being rejected, losing a valuable object, failing a test, getting injured in an accident, are analogous to the first arrow. They cause some pain. The second arrow, fired by our own selves, is our reaction, our storyline, and our anxiety. All of these things magnify the suffering. So how much of our own suffering are we magnifying as opposed to letting it go or letting it be? See the suffering for what it is. Suffering happens. It will happen to all. Okay, I see that. Let me let it be. Or, if I can, let go of it. Or transmute it. Right? I can change it, I can let it go, or I can simply let it be. Because no matter my circumstances, I have the power to choose, and I choose peace. Um, something else that Michael shared. Michael shared a couple of things this week. One, again, for those following the saga of the carriage house, uh, there was a, a chance this week to write some blessings on the studs of the carriage house so that they will always be underlying the walls. And when you look at the walls, you'll know, oh, these are the blessings that are under this house, in the foundation of the house. Um, and he, he thought of that because somebody else had shared that they had done it. And then he also shared a video. And I would, I would like for us to take a minute, I think it's like a, about a three and a half minute video. It's of Lisa Nichols. Some of you may remember her from the, the video version of The Secret, um, for those that ever watched that. But uh, Lisa Nichols is uh, an author and speaker. She's highly motivational, at least I find her so. So if we can get that video, and I will step aside here to watch for a moment. And, and we need sound. We might have to restart. <laughs> this class, I got a fail in English. And my English teacher said in front of the entire class, Lisa, you have to be the weakest writer. <laughs> Ding. It's a life of hustle and survival. I remember when my, my ninth grade teacher asked me, Lisa, what do you want to be when you grow up? And see, I had to fight the Harlem Crip 30s every day to get home from school, so I looked at her and said a lie. I took an English class, I got a fail in English. And my English teacher said in front of the entire class, Lisa, you have to be the weakest writer I've ever met in my entire life. Don't worry, my story ends good. <laughs> Don't feel sorry for me. I got seven under my belt. And then the same year my speech teacher said, after giving me a D minus, I knew I, I knew I had an A in speech. Like, come on. <laughs> he obviously didn't agree with me. He gave me a D minus and said, quote unquote, Miss Nichols, I recommend you never speak in public, that you get a desk job. So here's the beauty of that story. Other people's perception of you ain't none of your business. <laughs> Everything you've ever been through, set through, rose through, cried through, prayed through, everything is a setup for your next best season. And the way you forgive the perceivingly unforgivable, the way you love the perceivingly unlovable, the way you accept what seems to be unacceptable, the way you embrace after you've been betrayed, the way you do that is the way you believe us. Your light belongs to everyone who'll be illuminated because you were bold enough and obedient enough to let your light shine. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And every time you cross someone's path and they can't handle your light, you know those people that they try to give you reasons why you should tone it down a bit. That they would tell Cheryl not to sing so loud. Hey. Right, right, right. They would tell me to shut up in class. They tell you you're kind of strange. You know those people, dream snatchers, hey. vision busters. Don't be mad at them. They can only love you to the capacity in which they're able to love themselves. Don't be mad at them. Don't be mad at them. Pray for them. Love them. Because they're dealing with themselves like we're dealing with us. But 
I want you to remember that your 70 watts, your 70 watts has to be turned way up because you got way more to give us. It ain't over yet. Don't put a period where God put a comma. And when you turn it up to 159 watts, you know, you keep turning it up. You like, you stop dimming your light. You say, today is the first day of the rest of my life. You turn it up. You're going to find people that can't handle your light. And before today, you might have dimmed your light. You might have shrunk a little bit. You might have tempered it down a little bit. But after today, I want you to see this. After today, turn the lights up. After today, you don't dare dim your light. As your light gets brighter, as your light gets brighter, you're going to disrupt some people. And they're going to tell you your light's too bright. Your light's too bright. Your light's too bright. Your light's too bright. Then you just look at them and say, well, I'm not dimming my light. I'm just going to hand you some shades. <laughs> I'm just saying why don't you start carrying around an extra pair of shades not dimming my light I'm just gonna wear some shades um, I love this story and how she shows that she let those crazy makers those naysayers be part of her motivation to prove them wrong and did not listen to them other than to say, I know better. So I, I want to end uh, with a really brief reading. This is from my new favorite poet, uh, John Rodell. I read a poem of his a couple weeks ago, uh, and I'll need some help from Michael on this one, uh, because it is a conversation between me and God, and it's called Become, Become, Become. Hey, God. Hello. I'm falling apart. Can you put me back together? I would rather not. Why? Because you aren't a puzzle. But what about all the pieces of my life that are falling down onto the ground? Let them stay there for a while. They fell off for a reason. Take some time and decide if you need any of those pieces back. You don't understand. I'm breaking down. No, you don't understand. You are breaking through. What you are feeling are just growing pains. You are shedding the things and the people in your life that are holding you back. You aren't falling apart. You're falling into place. Relax. Take some deep breaths and allow those things you don't need anymore to fall off of you. Quit holding onto the pieces that don't fit you anymore. Let them fall off. Let them go. Once I do that, what will be left of me? Only the very best pieces of you. I'm scared of changing. I keep telling you, you aren't changing. You are becoming. Becoming who? Becoming who I created you to be. A person of light and love and charity and hope and courage and joy and mercy and grace and compassion. I made you for more than the shallow pieces you have decided to adorn yourself with that you cling to with such greed and fear. Let those things fall off of you. I love you. Don't change. Become. Become. Become who I made you to be. I'm going to keep telling you this until you remember it. There goes another piece. Yep. Let it be. So, I'm not broken? Of course not. But you are breaking like the dawn. It's a new day. Become. And so it is. Namaste. <laughs>